Presley for uh, being our presenter today and talking about this important subject. My pleasure, Jay. I'm going to owe you lunch for that introduction. That was that was very nice. Uh, I have, a, I think, a half an hour, so I'm going to try to get done by one, actually, so that there's time for questions. I know a lot of people have, you know, unique situations, or all of you have a unique situation, and so I want to make myself available for for questions too. Um, I do have a list of everything I'm going to talk about with some of the notes on a sheet that will get to you afterwards, either in person here or electronically. I just don't give it out because then you'll spend your time reading that uh, or skipping ahead. So we'll give it out at the end, but obviously feel free to take notes throughout. Uh, real quick, so if just show of hands, how many of you would prefer to avoid moving for the rest of your life? Okay. That's pretty much the statistic. If you talk to anybody, uh, particularly over the age of 70, they say, if I have the choice, I want to stay at home for the rest of my life, and I want to pass away at home if I have that choice as well. So I want to do two things before I get into my list. Number one is I want to encourage you uh, that it's possible. I think a lot of people think that it's not possible to do that, but in 10 years, I've seen hundreds of people accomplish that goal and uh, pass away in their home without having had to move to uh, their children's home or a facility of some kind. Uh, and uh, so just hope that that's encouraging. It's not a, an unrealistic goal for you to have. I also want to challenge you because it's not a goal that happens on its own. You have to make a plan and take action steps around the things that you can control if you want that goal to be achieved. Uh, that's the challenge. A lot of folks sit back and just cross their fingers and hope that they're gonna get to stay independent at home. But uh, without some of these things that I'm gonna recommend to you today, they sometimes don't achieve that goal. Uh, so, there are things outside of your control. I'm gonna to try to avoid those because there's nothing we can do about those. But as far as things within your control, I tried to focus this list on uh, steps. educate themselves about all the different services that are available to come into your home. Uh, there's mobile notaries. One of those joins us on the Zoom call. There's mobile attorneys. There's mobile home care services. There's mobile hospice. There's home remodification, uh, remodeling services. There are a lot of, of things out there that come into your home. In addition to that, you can educate yourself about dementia, you can educate yourself about other chronic conditions, classes here at Benavia. So that's a real high level message to you to say, know as much as you can about the aging journey as possible. Uh, the action step I recommend is just once a week, find an educational session like this, either online or in person and go to that. At the end of the year, you'll find that you went to 52, right? So You'll know 52, at least one thing from each of those, you'll know 52 new things. Uh, but focus on our topics that are related to uh, the later years of your life and the challenges that come with that, okay? So number one, educate yourself. Uh, number two, count the cost. Uh, in this case, what I mean by that is how much money do you have, okay? A lot of folks don't want to talk about their finances. And I understand that. It's not something that maybe you feel comfortable with yourself, certainly not comfortable talking about it in public. And I, that's totally fine. But I run into many people who just don't even know what their financial situation really is, nor do they know how much 
long-term care costs. So they don't know how much home care costs. They don't know how much living in a facility costs. They don't know how much their uh, maintenance of their home costs. They don't know what it, what the expense would be to uh, widen those doorways in your in your house. And uh, so that's where it's a question of whether it's realistic for you to stay at home independently given your financial situation, okay? So you really need to, in that case, take the action step of sitting down with a trusted advisor, either a professional money manager or an individual that you trust, a personal friend or family member, and getting a handle on what your current and your potential likely financial situation is going to be over the next 10 years. The fact of the matter is, 70% of people over the age of 65 are going to need long-term care, okay? So seven out of 10. So there's no reason to avoid thinking about it, planning for it, understand there is gonna be a cost associated with that most likely, okay? I really, the last thing I'll say about counting the cost is that Medicare will not save you I'm sorry, most of you probably had that experience already where you realize Medicare still costs money. And when I have health care issues, those still cost money. And a lot of people I run into are waiting for Medicare to step in and save the day by sending in caregivers or providing transportation or giving them the special surgery that they want to have. And it's just not a good idea to expect that to be covered. Plan on paying and, and understand what your uh, what your costs are or what your situation is. Okay, so we're educating ourselves, we're counting the cost. Number three, we're doing what I call a friends and family inventory. So here we say, well, who really loves you? And I mean, really loves you. <laughs> Not who do you wish loved you, not who do you think might start loving you, not any of those things. Be honest with yourself, who really loves you? Are you close with your family relationally? Are you close with your family geographically? Uh, will they pitch in emotionally, physically, financially? If the time comes where you wanna stay at home but you need help, to stay at home. Uh, typically, when I talk to people who want to stay in their home and avoid a move, they're looking first for friends or family to get involved and help with things they may need help with. Uh, but they realize, in some cases, family is not willing to do that. Or family lives in Chicago and can't do that, uh, right? Family's got jobs. Family has other commitments. So. Uh, and then friends, to be honest, have a very short shelf life when you need ongoing help. And I'm, I know I'm laying out some hard truths today, but I think that's probably better than sugarcoating this. Uh, friends, you know, family might stick around for a year, friends maybe for a week, okay? <laughs> uh, if you're counting on your neighbor to be the person who helps you stay in your home, for the long haul, that's not a good plan, no matter how good of a neighbor you have right now, okay? Mm -hmm. So do an inventory of that and understand who do I actually have? And, and maybe the decision is I need to move closer to my family because they're willing, but they're really not gonna be able to do that from Chicago, right? So uh, and doing that while you still can move might be the answer. Again, that's case by case, but you need to know who loves you, really. Number four, uh, build a team, okay? Uh, there's a famous saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it also takes a village to keep an older adult in their home, <laughs> in some cases, okay? And if you do your research ahead of time and identify the people, and services that you trust, you can build the team that you're going to need 
if and when the time comes that you need short-term or long-term help to continue living at home, right? Uh, I met with a family who did a wonderful job of this. Husband had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, has a very difficult path ahead, but knows the path largely. This is likely what's going to begin happening in my, to my body, what I'm not going to be able to do. And so they went out, they looked into what they interviewed home care agencies, determined which ones they felt comfortable with, got on record with them that, okay, we, you know who we are, we know who you are, if time comes, we're going to give you a call. They went to assisted living facilities, they went to uh, hospices, memory care communities, uh, they went and investigated mobile notary services, and they made an actual list of the people they would trust if and when the time comes that they needed help for a week or a month or a year so that they could stay at home and not be forced uh, to move out. So building a team is a really good step to take when you're still healthy enough and independent enough to, uh, to continue to do that. Uh, so write that down. That's the action step. Uh, find out what their service is, what their purpose is, write down their contact information and uh, keep that team somewhere where you or your loved one knows how to find it. Which brings me to point number five, which is you need to communicate all this, all right? In writing and in person. Uh, I'm not going to make you raise your hand and tell me whether or not you've written down all your desires for where you want to live, what services you do and don't want to receive, uh, because I know that very few of you would raise your hands. It's just not something that people take the time to do. You need to write this down. I would suggest formally finding an attorney getting a documents in place. There's other ways that you can do it without an attorney, and I'm happy to talk about that. But uh, you need to get this stuff written down. For example, do you want uh, end of life care? Do you want to be kept alive with certain uh, you know, treatments and things at the end of life? But even aside from that, uh, do you want to continue to live at home? Are you adamant about that? What plans do you have? And when you decide who's going to execute those plans, you need to tell them about it. You need to say, hey, I've chosen you to be my executor or to take care of this for me. Please, uh, please step in and do this when the time comes. Okay, so you really got to make these plans and communicate these plans out to folks. Okay, that's five. Schedule a referral meeting with the attorney is an action step there. Schedule it with somebody so that you can have a free discussion about what documents you should have in place. Uh, these actions will help you stay independent at home because if you don't have them, you might end up getting moved against your will. You may end up uh, in a situation you don't want to be in because you didn't write it down. Okay, number six. You really need to evaluate your environment, your current environment. Is your current environment a safe long-term solution for you? Right? Um, do you have adequate space in your hallway for a wheelchair? Do you have adequate room in your bathroom? Do you have grab bars? Do you have at least somebody who can install that stuff for you. But I would say even more so than that, um, do you know what you're going to need to make changes to in your home in order to make it a safe environment if it's not right now? Uh, are you gonna have to do a full-blown remodel because it's just not set up for an older person who has different needs than you? Uh, or is it just going to take a few tweaks like a $50 grab bar and you're good to go? So uh, that has to do with cost as well. Now, the action step there is that there are physical therapists who have companies. Uh, there's home care like me. 
we will come and do a free assessment of your home and make recommendations about how you can make it a safer environment now and in the future. Um, I'm in my 40s. If my environment's not safe, I could fall. I could end up with a fall that's unnecessary because I don't have adequate lighting or because I have throw rugs or a cord that runs across my kitchen that I trip on. Uh, you, however, are not in your 40s, and you have an even greater risk of those types of things happening. And one of the ways you stay independent at home is by avoiding what I would call stupid, unnecessary mistakes like that. You don't need to fall. Uh, that is that rug really adding quality of life at this point, or is it just a trip hazard? Right. So these are the types of things to look at when you're evaluating your current your home environment. Uh, okay, I think I'm doing pretty good here. I'm rolling fast, I know, but I'm going to give you all these notes so you can you'll have them and you can review them. Number seven. This one's going to seem extremely obvious, but you need to live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not going to get into all the details about how you can train your brain and your body to stay healthy. But uh, when I go meet with a family and they say, well, we spend eight, eight hours a day sitting in front of the television and we want to continue to live independently but we have, you know, congestive heart failure and swelling in the legs and pain in our backs. And we don't eat well, we eat fast food all the time. You know, that's, those are some real red flags about whether you're gonna truly be able to stay independent. Um, and again, I don't wanna be too harsh here, but if you're not continuing to live that healthy lifestyle, especially as you age, you know, me pulling a muscle at my age is one thing. You pulling a muscle at your age is a much more serious situation and harder to recover from. Uh, so the point is little things as you get older and older grow into bigger things when it comes to the health of your body and your mind. So Continuing to exercise, turn off the TV, go for a walk, do balance exercises. They're very simple, very simple exercises that you can do with your arms and legs to stay, uh, to keep your ability to balance uh, for an extra couple of years, right? That makes a big difference. Eat well. Uh, now, quick funny story. We had a 97 year old uh, client one time who was uh, on, I think she was either on hospice or considering going on hospice. She must not have been on hospice yet, but she had had a long, healthy, happy life. And her she had just gone to the doctor for a heart checkup and the doctor had said, you need to get off the bacon and start eating turkey bacon. And she said, I'm 97 years old. I am not going to start eating turkey bacon now. That's not happening. And I said, that's totally fine with me. I'm not a doctor, but I understand where you're coming from. So don't hear me wrong here. If you, I'm not saying you have to give up all the treats and things that you've enjoyed your whole life, but living a healthy lifestyle is very, very, very important. Okay. Uh, okay, now that's seven. The action step there is to do the thing, live a healthy lifestyle. Number eight, don't wait too long to get help uh, when you need it, okay? A uh, little help goes a long way if you get it early, but it, a need can turn into a crisis quickly if you let it go too long. And you don't want to be trying to stay at home in the midst of a crisis because you're gonna get less quality care and it, it's gonna be at a higher cost. And it's possible that you won't be able to achieve your goal of staying at home because you let it become a crisis. Uh, good example of this, is, you know, people have, a lot of time it's money related. They don't wanna start spending their money. Even if they have a long-term care policy, they'll wait uh, until they need caregivers eight or 10 hours a day instead of just a few hours. Uh, once a week. 
and, or coming to Benavia for a little bit of time or getting a break before things really spiral out of control. Uh, if, you, if you catch it early, get some help early, you're much more likely to be able to continue living at home uh, and continue to maintain your independence. So don't wait too long to do that. You know, that's just a mental action step for you to write down to remind yourself when the time comes. Uh, go ahead and ask for help. Okay, number nine, this is where I sneak in my little sales pitch for caregivers. Uh, I own a caregiving agency. So number nine, caregivers are a great way to stay uh, independent at home because they help you prevent a fall. They can go and do things for you that have become more difficult like shopping, uh, taking out the trash. I can't tell you how many people who have fallen on the side of their bed trying to change their sheets and uh, been stuck there. And if they had had a caregiver doing that instead, they wouldn't have had the fall. They wouldn't have ended up in the hospital. They wouldn't have ended up in rehab and they wouldn't be uh, moved to an assisted living facility that they never wanted to go to. So having a little bit of caregiving help as much as that sounds like a sales pitch from somebody who owns a caregiving agency, having a little bit of caregiving help at those early stages can really help you avoid needing a lot more of that later on and avoid those stupid mistakes that uh, can help you or can hurt the opportunity to achieve your, your goal of staying at home and staying independent. All right, so hiring a caregiver. Uh, we can talk more about where the caregivers come from. You can either hire private ones who work for themselves, or you can hire from a company like mine, uh, where we are the oversight and the insurance and all that. So that's into the weeds on, on that topic. But I would suggest that you interview a few agencies, just like you would interview a hospice or another service interview over the phone or in person, no charge, talk to three, pick two. And then when the time comes, call those two and say, I'd like, I'd like to try having a caregiver come out and uh, spend some time with myself and my loved one. So that's part of building your team. I would build a, have a caregiver agency kind of waiting in the wings should you need it. Okay, and number 10, maybe the most sensitive one next to cost, and that is, that you need to have an exit strategy. Uh, I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but what, what that means is when you're in your final days or weeks or months, what is it that you uh, want from the healthcare industry? So do you want life-saving treatment to go on? Because our medical, care has gotten to the point where they can and will keep you alive at whatever quality of life they can provide unless you tell them not to. And if that's what you want to do, that's perfectly fine. And if that's not what you want to do, there's a hospice is available to you in that case. My point here is make a choice, make a decision, educate yourself about hospice care, uh, and, and then write down and communicate what it is you want. Because I have seen a lot of people who had the goal of staying at home their whole life, right up to the end, who could have done that if they would have communicated what they wanted in those last days, weeks, or months of their life. Instead, they drifted into a uh, unconsciousness or they drifted into some state of being where it was no longer their choice and therefore it was the opportunity was taken away from them so the action step there is do you understand hospice you need to come to the hospice myths seminar if you don't understand hospice it's one of the most misunderstood and underused services in the industry and I would highly recommend that if you don't already have a very clear understanding of what hospice is and is not, that you uh, make a, an appointment to, to learn, All right? That will help you with the uh, aforementioned exit strategy. Now you, now you know what I mean by an exit strategy. 
Uh, so, okay, 102. Yeah, I'm flying. I'm flying through this. That is but I perfect. got people here. We've only got a few folks, and I know they're going to have questions. So, those are your top 10. Now I can pass out to the folks here in the room uh, this. And Jay, I don't, I didn't send it to you electronically. Okay. So, I don't guess you have a way to, to get it to them, but. Oh, I do. We can get that to you. Maybe you can maybe you can do that afterwards. I can scan it and part. email it to everybody. You can scan it and uh, or show it or whatever. Yeah. If you like, if you folks would like to go off mute, that's uh. If you have questions and the field is open, don't be bashful. <laughs> I, I appreciate that Presley is such relevant and important information, and you didn't sugarcoat this. That's very important. That's that's kind of the gist of what we we're trying to do here is get vital information out to the community that they can really use. I mean, you, you don't want to be told, you know, oh, you can stay at home forever, you know, just, uh, you know, call your in-laws and they'll come take care of you. That doesn't happen. That's, uh, I've, got, I've got four kids and I haven't seen them. Well, the only time I see them is when they want a check written or, you know, they want somebody to babysit. So <laughs> you don't call your in-laws. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but if you have some questions and I'll just thank you for the plug. On uh, our September 21st, our next uh, lunchtime learning is going to be the five biggest myths surrounding hospice care. And I, I think Presley can attest, we have a wonderful woman from uh, Hospice of the West is going to be our presenter. And she's done it very well, very succinctly, so it's easy to understand. So uh, thank you for that, Presley, at number 10 and the X strategy. Yeah. I love that. So. Uh, yeah, this is your any, time. Any questions, too? They don't have to be related to this. I mean, I've been doing it for a long time. Yeah, so. you can talk about Presley's business. Yeah. Can and, I actually just make a comment? Yes. So I am a mobile notary, and I'm out there doing a lot of different types of notarizations. I do a lot of mortgage signings. Um, and I can tell you, as a notary, my job is to make sure somebody is competent enough to sign documents. And I've actually gone into... Uh, mortgage signings where they're trying to refinance the house and one in particular the very first one I remember um, when I became a notary I know that they were trying to refinance the house to get money to help the wife and she had no capacity to be able to sign any documents at all and it put and I had to refuse to do the signing um, because by law I can't do a I can't do a signing and they had none of their documents in order that um, Preston was just talking about. They had nothing in place and she was so far advanced in either dementia or Alzheimer's, I don't know which one it was, that she didn't know who she was or what was going on at all. So it's just, a, it's so important to have a plan in place like Preston is talking about because if we don't, then anything it actually cost our families more money at that point because they'd have to go after guardianship or conservatorship that kind of thing which law, the lawyers and the in the courts and everybody else get involved um and so they couldn't pull the money out of their house that both names were on the house so the husband couldn't pull the money out of the house to be able to help his wife and that's not a good position to be in so just important things to think about when you're when you're planning um as you're as you're aging Thank you, Mindy. That, you know, that's very important. I'm just going to give you a slice of life story on that. I'm in my mid 60s. I'm newly married, uh, sold two houses and moved into a third one. And the last thing we thought about was what is our final paperwork going to look like, my new wife and I. And so we spent the last two weekends at our attorney getting everything put into place. And it's amazing how many little details you forget about. So even if you're feeling confident that you have everything planned out and ready to go, take another look. Because there's things like something as simple as your passcodes on the internet, um, you know, your bank codes, your, your uh, security boxes at the bank, things like that that you forget about that are very vital and very important. You don't want the state getting your hands on anything. So make sure you have all this drawn up ahead of time, or at least have somebody competent you can turn to to help you with that. So that was a great point, Mindy. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question, and that is, 
Um, I've been around people that have needed some home health care. Mm -hmm. And I have found that in most cases, it was very, very difficult to find good home health care. Mm -hmm. um, especially when the person did not want to spend the money and they were going the route of looking in the paper and picking out somebody that they know nothing about and interviewing them, but it was all about what they charged an hour, okay? And I try to tell her that that it was not the way to do it because you know nothing about this person that you are allowing in your house mm -hmm. and you have really no idea what they're doing because she was on oxygen mm -hmm. and so she would be she couldn't just get up and follow the person and see what they were doing and um and unfortunately because um I recommended that she consider trying to see if, as hard as it may have been, I felt it was not impossible if we could find a living. Mm -hmm. you no, know, pretty hard, but she really needed someone there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and because she didn't have a living, because I saw the handwriting on the wall, she was going to die in that house alone because of her great need of oxygen and it kept falling out of her nose. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she would then fall asleep, lack of oxygen, okay? And sure enough, it did her in. It, she was alone and yeah. felt she, it's the, the oxygen fell out of it. Cause she would say to me, I, I'll, when I, she, she was sleeping on the couch cause she no longer could sleep in her bed because of whatever difficulty she was having. Mm -hmm. And she would even say that she would pull it out of her nose and not even know she was doing it. And sure enough, she was on the couch and she obviously um the oxygen mm -hmm. fell out and she fell off the couch and she died mm -hmm. right there on the floor all by herself you know and and, but, and that was because she and she had the money mm -hmm. she had the money to afford at least more help and she just no. didn't want to spend it and so what good did her money do her when she didn't want to spend it uh, it's a, it's a, I hate to use fear to motivate, uh, and when I'm fearing, but that story illustrates my point, right? You, you, you have to be ready to, uh, to ask for help. And, you know, if that's the choice she makes, that's the choice she makes, uh, but there are consequences right. to them. And, uh, that's a hard one, but yeah. it's a good example of what can happen. So Preston, how do you, um, how does your company go about um, vetting, I guess, the caregivers that you guys hire? Sure. So back to the difference between hiring somebody out of the newspaper, right? You're, you're just trusting them to say that they're qualified, to say that they're not going to take advantage of you. Uh, et cetera. In addition to that, you have some responsibilities as an employer from a tax and liability standpoint uh, as well. And I tell families, you are going to, in the short run, save money by hiring somebody out of the newspaper. They're going to charge you less per hour than I would. The question is, are you going to save money in the long run if they end up taking advantage of you or if they slip and fall in your house and end up suing you for workers? compensation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a risk that every family has to decide whether or not they're willing to take. In our company, Mindy, we do a 10-step hiring process that includes a drug test, background check, skills examination, reference checks, uh, the whole kind of gamut of due diligence that we can offer to make sure our clients have somebody comfortable coming, you know, somebody confident, caring and comfortable coming into their home. Uh, and most of the agencies, certainly the ones that Benavia works with, um, most of the agencies out here that if you get a referral to them from a trusted partner like Benavia are, are doing their best to weed out the, the dangerous, unskilled people. So I, you know, we're all, I think the good ones, as long as you're in the 
getting a referral from somebody you trust, those agencies are trying to take those steps. Then the question becomes, will the agency work with you to make sure you stay comfortable with that person and that they're a good fit? So I always tell the story of uh, how we have taken a caregiver through that whole process, and then we put her with clients, and every single client says, she just will not shut up. She just talks incessantly, you know, and, but she was a wonderful lady. She just would not stop talking when she was at these clients' homes. And so we'd go and they, the client would call and say, you know, she does a great job. She, she's really taking good care of me or my mom or my spouse. But I, I'm just so exhausted when she leaves because it's just yap, yap, yap. So finally, though, I, I sat her down and I said, listen, you're wonderful, but you have you've proven to me that you cannot stop talking. I'm giving you one more chance to go in and be with this next client. And if it doesn't work out, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to find something else. She said, okay, I'm sorry. I know I talk too much. Everyone's told me that my whole life. So I put her with this last person and they were peas in a pod. They just, you go over there and these two are just, yeah, but, yeah, but they're not listening to each other at all. They're just talking, 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 talking about both of them, the client and the caregiver. Beautiful fit, probably two years where they were just 20 hours a week with each other talking the whole time. So there is another level beyond making sure you have done all the vetting to where you're, you're actually as an agency trying to match make a little bit. I, it's a funny story. But uh, you should have uh, a caregiving uh, partner that's that's trying to do some of that to make sure you're comfortable. They need the skill set too. So the last thing I'll say is, you know, we train a lot of our caregivers around dementia because it's such a growing need and a common request for our clients uh, that they have someone they or, or their loved one has dementia. So our caregivers really need to be trained in how to interact with somebody that has any form of dementia, Alzheimer's, Lewy body, vascular, et cetera. So uh, that's another thing that we're really emphasizing as a business is training the caregivers. And you're not going to get that typically from, from the newspaper. So. Thank you. Anybody got a particular situation or uh, something that they run into gotta be finance questions it's always finance questions. well i can just throw, throw out a situation that we actually had with my grandfather he wanted um to be here to, he was living with us and he had fallen and broken his hip and then it was just from there it was one thing after another and he just kept saying he wanted to come home he was done he didn't want to keep doing procedures and whatnot he was 88 so we brought him home and we needed to get 24 hour care. So we were interviewing, we interviewed a couple of different or three different um, places. And I don't even remember which one we ended up going with because this was back in 07, um, but it was not a good experience for us because he needed 24 hour care and they kept changing the, uh, every, every shift was a different caregiver. And which meant, I was here and I was the one that was constantly, they'd have to know how to do everything and where everything is. And you know, you're constantly basically training them every single day. Every 12 hours, I was training a new caregiver, right? Or 24 hours. If I was lucky, I got 24 hours. And so that did, I'll be honest, that did not leave a good taste in my mouth about, uh, about that. So are there ways that you guys could go about avoiding that? I mean, because we actually looked for some place that said, They'll be on for three days. One caregiver will be there for three days and then be off for four. And the next caregiver will be there for four days. So we actually found somebody that said that and they work as a team and it's always the same people. And then that never happened over a month's time. So not even one day, you know? So how do you go about trying to make sure that all works out to be what it's supposed to be? Because that seriously made life harder on me. It would have been easier if I had just taken care of it myself. Sure. Well, I'm sorry you had that experience. Let me, I mean, it sounds like maybe nuts and bolts of, of the caregiving business could be a little bit helpful in the 10 minutes that we have left. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about costs. 
and I'll talk a little bit about how we structure schedules and things like that. Um, the caregiving industry as a whole has around 80% turnover per year for each company. Uh, now, I've been doing this for 10 years, and that's been pretty much the standard, you know, in the industry. And that's not necessarily because caregivers are unreliable or the companies are doing anything wrong. Uh, caregivers need work, for example. And if they have a client who goes to the hospital, then immediately they're out of work. And so often they work for multiple agencies so that if one agency doesn't have work for them, the other one will. Uh, so there's just a, a variety of factors. I think it is important, and I tell families this, uh, it's gonna require some work to get to a schedule and a consistency that uh, you're comfortable with. And I tell them it usually takes two to three weeks Sometimes we nail it the first time. Sometimes it takes a couple of weeks or more to get into a rhythm where your schedule fits the caregiver's schedule, your personality fits the caregiver's personality, and you get a, a team in there that is uh, understanding the needs and the environment and, and providing the right type of care. Uh, I will say that in your case, Mindy, I would I would feel terrible if you were talking about my agency in that case. Um, one example of what we would do differently for you would have been we do eight hour shifts. And we've just found that eight hour shifts on a 24 hour client is a better model because if you have a caregiver that gets a flat tire or gets sick, then the person can work a double. Uh, if you have eight hour shifts that allows them to still have their personal life going on outside of their 12 hour shift that day. It's just a better routine. And quite frankly, 24 hour shifts uh, are the smoothest clients for us because people are paying, they're willing to pay for it. And the caregivers have plenty of work to keep them busy. And so uh, those are typically the, the situations where we have the most consistency. It's it's the four hours twice a week or every time the moon is full that makes it really hard. I tell families, I can't send somebody to Wickenburg every third Thursday for an hour and a half. It's just not going to happen. So, you know, you have to work with the company and understand what the, you know, what hurdles we have to get over in order to provide the care as well. Now, again, cost is a huge factor here. Uh, caregiving rates, even in the last couple of years, have gone up. I'd say now from, I bet you three years ago, I would have told you that you could definitely get it under $30 an hour, maybe $28. There's, it's very unlikely that you could work with a company now that's going to charge you less than $33 to $38 an hour. Um, so I think $35 is probably a good number to do your calculations with. And when you think about that, 10 hours a day, that's $350 a day. 24 hours a day, we get into some really, really big expenses that most families can't afford. Um, and what I tell folks when it comes to cost is that really when you're, if you're needing around six, anywhere between six and eight hours a day of care, that's about the break point for assisted living, where you're paying the same amount at home for a caregiver as you would be paying if you were living in an assisted living community. But you can kind of get up to that six or eight hours a day. Uh, and, and there's a big range in assisted living, so don't hold me to that entirely. I just try to give people a ballpark. Um, but yeah, thirty-five dollars an hour. So you can cut, and the average home care client is twenty hours a week. Okay, so seven hundred dollars a week on average uh, across the country is uh, something you can kind of get in your head, like, oh wow, that's too expensive for me. That's no problem for me, etc. Uh, just to give you some idea on uh, what in-home care. Now remember. In-home care is also one-on-one. -on -one. 
care. Whereas in a facility, you're going to have one caregiver for every eight people or one caregiver for every 10 people. So you're not going to have a caregiver that's there just for you. So you are going to, that's why you end up paying more if you want to hire one of our people for an extended amount of time. It's, it's very customized. So that's enough on that. I want to make sure I got seven or eight minutes if you have a question about something else. Thank you. That's I love pets. Yeah, okay. So the question, if you didn't hear it, was what about uh, clients who want the caregiver to help with the pet? Again, this is a very customized type of service. And I'm not selling you either a red watch or a yellow watch or a blue watch. We're talking about what do you exactly need and want? So if you're telling me, well, I've got a uh, Rottweiler who really doesn't like people, but I'd love for the caregiver to pick up the Rottweiler's poop uh, every time they come, I'm probably going to say, I'm probably going to refer them to my competitor and say, you know, yeah, I think, I think Bob's company will take, take care of that. But if you have a, you know, a reasonable pet, bird, cat, dog, uh, it throws another factor in because we have caregivers who are allergic to pets. So we might not have as big of a pool to pull from, et cetera. But we, I mean, nine times out of 10, people don't have Rottweilers in Sun City West uh, or Surprise or Peoria or Glen or all the places we serve. And so we, we can work it out. So pit bulls. I mean, it, again, some people have a real pleasant pit bull, and some of our caregivers love pit bulls, so no problem. But I'm going to say, well, if you have a pit bull in here, it could be you might need to give me some more time to find the right caregiver oh, for yeah. you. You know, I mean, you can't just say, well, I don't know why they don't like my pit bull, <laughs> just because they growl at them every time they come. I mean, you know. Yeah. You well, know, no, you know, right. Just, I mean, you know, my insurance company had a list of dogs that said that. Yeah. You know, that they really didn't want to cover me because I had my own one of these dogs. Sure. They were sure. my risk. Yeah, I have a trampoline in my backyard. They yeah, don't want to do that. Yeah. It could be the friendliest dog in the world, but usually but you, a pit bull is upwards of 40, 50 pounds, right. yeah. which is a risk itself physically yeah. because sure. it comes over right. and wants to say hi to you. Right. You know, you're on the your ground. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. And as a business owner, I don't want to put my caregivers in. So, so yes, on pets. Uh, it just it just depends on the situation. But our caregivers will walk the dog. Our caregivers will help, uh, you know, change the cat litter and things. Caregivers don't want to be housekeepers, um, and they don't want to be pet. They don't want to be dog walkers. Otherwise, they would have gone and got a job as a housekeeper or a dog walker. They want to care for people. So uh, I will tell families, you know, if you're just going to have them come in here and mop the floor. That's not what we're here for. Call Molly Maids for that. But if you're going to have us help you transfer and take a bath, get dressed, care for somebody with dementia, and them off the floors, no problem. We do those things too. But our primary service is uh, related to caring for the individual. Ellen, you're you're on mute. Do you know how to get off there? Yes, I'm just thinking um, this has been an awesome presentation. You really did a good job and lots of good points. But at this point, if I don't need the personal care, but I'm looking at the care for, you know, changing the sheets and some of the other housework, then that's a different group than what you, your business is. Yes, ma'am. Okay. You should call, you know, Mary Maids or look for a housekeeping service. Uh, if you're just needing help with that. But right now, I really need to set up an appointment with you because at 80, with two of us, anything could happen any day. Right. That's that's a. You, you, I couldn't have said it better. You build your team, do your research now. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so that and Mindy's example. You've got somebody discharging from rehab, 
you're going to be scrambling to interview those companies at that point. Whereas if you interview us now and you get a comfort level with who we are and what we're committed to, what our rates are, then uh, we already know you when you call. We know you're at, yeah. we have you on file, et cetera. So that's building a team. Okay, we have two sons that are dealing with in-laws who are scrambling at the moment. So they're very concerned about us setting things up because they do not live in the immediate area to help us either. Yeah, good. I'm glad you're thinking ahead. That planning uh, makes a huge difference. I'm looking forward for the um, your paperwork to be emailed to me then too, because I'm one who's going to go right down the list and get it done. Oh, good, good. We'll send it over and then I'll send along a list of the things caregivers do as well. So you can, so you can see Great. the st distinction between what the caregiver in the home does and doesn't do. Okay, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. That's very nice of you to say, thank you. Thank you. Richard, you've been uh, suspiciously quiet there. We haven't heard from you. Well, you know, I, I like to attend these um, just to see if I've missed anything. A lot of these things, I've gone through the process already and uh, I just want to make sure that I've got uh, all the boxes checked and uh, so that's why I like to attend these. I do have a question, uh, probably more for Jay. Um, how do you reach out uh, for these seminars to get people to attend? I, I stumbled into this only because I was on Facebook and the link came up. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I actually expected there would be a lot more people. And I was wondering if, you know, exactly how you reach out to people to get people to attend this. Because we use Benavia now uh, for adult daycare and we really like it and i know you have a lot of clients and i suspect that a lot of them would be interested in this sort of of, of zoom meeting uh, so i'm surprised just to see a few people that's uh well you stole my thunder richard i was actually going to ask you how you found out about this because i didn't have you on my list mm -hmm. so i appreciate that and you found it through one of the channels mm -hmm. there's a myriad of different ways we do this just launched and we kind of wanted to get it out early um, for this month because we're going to this process this workshop series is going to run all the way till june of next year so we've got a lot of different presenters coming in a lot of different topics we're going to try to cover so but you will see us in the newspapers all the local newspapers uh, we will send out flyers we will send out emails uh, we will be on social media you will see us out to the local congregations and churches, passing out flyers as well, local networking and such. People in the industry like Presley will have that information because we share all the time. So we try to follow virtually every avenue we can to get the information out, as well as word of mouth. If you know somebody that needs help, we always rely on that. But yes, um, being the first one, I guess I would apologize that we didn't... Uh, we didn't have a month or two to get this one out and launched. Um, we actually had 14 people signed up. So um, I, I, you know, like I always like to say, when we do these things, when we did them in the spring, if there's a cloud in the sky, we only get 50% of the people there because they're worried it's going to rain at some point. So that's, that's, that's where we live in the Northwest Valley. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thanks for your support of Benavia. Uh, we love it. I want to thank Presley. You've done an amazing job here today. Um, just so you know, I will be following up. And um, I, would, I would like to get your email, Richard, as well, because I've got this, um, the top 10 list from Presley. And then he always sends me additional flyers and information and support resources that I like to send out afterwards to everybody. So at least they just have that. They have a starting point to, you know, to, uh, to jump from, from our conversation here today. So um, I get that out to everybody. And usually that's by a follow-up email or something. And then this is being recorded. So we will edit it and then put it on YouTube. And I'll also include that link. So if you have questions, you forgot mm -hmm. about something, you can always go back and look at the video as well to get those answers. So we try to cover all bases. How would you like to get my email? You do have it on file at Benavia, but okay. uh, another way you'd like to get it, just tell me. Right. If you want to give you want to give it to me now or 
I can look it, look it up. Okay, let it rip. It's a uh, far out rich F A R R O U T R I C H at gmail dot com. At gmail. So far out rich at gmail. I like that. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that. So wonderful. Well. In wrapping up, I appreciate it. And I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here today. I hope this was informative. Um, I did mention coming up in two weeks on the 21st, we'll be touching bases on the, the biggest Smiths surrounding hospice. So that kind of came up in our discussion today. Um, we have every two weeks, I will be sending out as a follow-up, uh, a calendar of each of these. So you can pick and choose whatever topics you like. If you go to our website, benavia.org, and check under the events page, you'll see a list of the uh, all of these workshops till the end of the year right now. And you can sign up for one or sign up for all of them at once if you like. And then don't forget, in November, we're having our Caregiver Connect event, which is a big event for caregivers and their, their loved ones. And that will be held in Sun City West. More details to come. So thank you again, Presley. And if you want to get a hold of Presley, I'll also have all his contact information as well. That way you can chat with him offline a little bit more about how he runs his company and what makes him so special in the Northwest Valley. They do an amazing job and we are so happy to have them as one of our partners here with Benavia. So thank you all, thank appreciate you. it. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for thank joining you. us.